Welcome to this panel. Uh, I, I state perhaps uh, the more international or the less interest, or uh, I don't know uh, why, but uh, uh, welcome in, in any way. Uh, in the next 50 minutes, uh, we'd like to explore with you how OER uh, have developed internationally in the late uh, last years and what the role of international organizations is in this field. Thank you for joining us. Uh, a special thanks to Mr. Jamor, who came from Slovenia, and Mr. Orr, who both have agreed to join us as experts uh, uh, on this panel. Uh, may I then, uh, may I first ask you to introduce yourself, and then I will uh, introduce myself. First you, and uh, then you. Okay. So, um, thank you very much for the introduction. So, my name is Miti Armol. I am actually working at the National Research Institute in Slovenia, in Ljubljana. So my background and what I do is research on artificial intelligence. So whatever I do besides that is actually a kind of a side effect that happened to us, which is open education and open education resources. So I'm also heading the department uh, for uh, knowledge transfer at the Institute, and I'm also the UNESCO chair on OER. Thank you. So my name is Dominic. Um, I've been working in on higher education research in, in comparative uh, perspective for probably the last 15 years. Um, but I've been focused on OER for the last uh, two years, particularly because I was given a contract by the OECD to, to look at this because I, uh, the OECD wanted to go back to OER and see what was happening in that area. My name is Walter Hirche. I've been uh, president of the German Commission for UNESCO for 12 years and now responsible for education uh, matters. So uh, uh, this was just a short introduction and now uh, uh, Mr. Jamal has agreed uh, to give us an idea of his work as one of six uh, uh, UNESCO chairs of OER uh, in the world. At the same time, he will present uh, to us the extensive experience of Slovenia uh, with OER, and uh, he will do this, all this, uh, in perspective of the contribution of international organizations to his work. So, the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. So, for first question to the big audience. <laughs> so, how, how much do you know about the OER chairs? Who, who is the OER chair, what that means? So this is a kind of a prolonged arm to the UNESCO. That actually UNESCO, this is the only way UNESCO can actually bring in expertise from the particular domain. So they are building up this OER chair, so you get a formal approval that you are the OER chair, but certainly you have to finance yourself and work as, as yourself as a, the credits on, on your organization. So actually, OER chairs are the ones who are trying to let's say, bring in and push forward activities that are there in UNESCO, plus co-create the particular activities. So what I will be showing you today are two things. So one is um, what is right now going on on the UNESCO site on OER. And then, of course, uh, the next thing would be how we in Slovenia uh, have been setting up the first national initiative on open education, which involves also OER. So um, this is the first slide I have here. It's actually showing you just um, what everybody more or less know. But there are three colors, because the first color actually shows the, the time when, when OER has been you know, in the Renaissance style of development. So it was fun. It was a hippie type of movement. It was, you know, let's try, let's test, let's see what will happen. But then the next thing came up, which was, which was actually more seriously, which then followed by several number of uh, regional, um, uh, regional, regional events, regional consultation events, policy development in different countries, in particularly different projects and different initiatives. And this is a little bit more serious. This actually became more like systemic approach towards, towards OER. And now we are coming into 2016, where we learn quite a lot about the OER. We learn quite a lot about the obstacles which are there. We learn quite a lot about the what are benefits. And we came to the point that we have to do something 
a little bit more seriously than we did till now. And if you look around, uh, and in particular last year when we have the conference, Open Education Conference, uh, I was amazed where, when the big players came in to the conference to looking at what are the potential business models around OER. And this is happening right now. So the last news you probably saw was uh, Amazon uh, getting into OER, which would be a very serious issue. So uh, this is what actually was there, and it's, uh, it's you still see that there is uh, the last title I have, the last, uh, uh, the, the last number is 2014. But, so you can see the increase of OER development. So there is a great awareness was there about build, build up. A lot of OER materials has been developed, but the problem which is right now is that there is not much use. So when we are talking to when you're talking to students, when we're talking to professors, and particularly teachers, the usual answer is that it's too complicated, it takes too much time, which I don't have. And I want to mess with it. So why is it like this? Because all this stuff is, is in various isolated uh, sites around the world. Um, there are different modalities of OER materials. So from textual, to PDFs, to videos, to audio, whatever. So there are a lot of things around there. Various formats. So if you want to access all these different type of formats, of course you have problems. This is the language diversity. There are many materials in English, of course, but there are many also in other languages. So if you want to use something which is in other, in other language and you have to translate it, there are tools already right now to help you that, but still, it's a lot of work. There are unresolved rights. You, so you have a lot of materials which are proclaimed to be OER, but without any sign of any license. So you don't really know whether this is OER or can be used or reused. Then different, type, different levels of quality. This is in particular problematic when you are looking at who is the author and where this thing come from. And in particular, the students and kids are very allergic on something which usually doesn't really fit to, to what they think about the quality. Undescribed mode of use. So there are different types of uh, how to use these materials. And then dead links. So if you go around and we as ICT people, we know. So usually you will get like 50% of dead links. So nobody is taking care about maintaining these materials, and this is a problem. So um, there are other obstacles which, which are there and has been identified. So first of all is right now there is a war between, usually between the, the government and the publishers on the other side, which is wrong because they both have their own capacities. And what we do in Slovenia, we started to talk to them. We sit behind the same table and we started to talk how can we do something both together on OER. There are things that publishers can bring in that governments cannot. There are things that publishers can bring in that OER creators cannot. So there are just things just have to develop, have to test what type of a business model should be there. Language and cultural barriers, this is what I described already. Although, so since I'm coming from the AI world, so the, 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 the people that actually are creating things like automatic translation tools, we know that we are very, very close. So already today, you will find several services that are very, very good in automatic translation. So it's just about a few months from now or a few years from now that you will have everything automatically translated in real time. You have already the phone, so I know that the, the guys at the uh, in Samsung, so in Samsung people internally, they already have the automatic translation on the mobile phone, so this works already. It's just that this is not being pu pushed into, into the public. So language and cultural barriers. Inclusive and equitable access to quality of content. So in particular, disabilities, quality assurance, and various ICT environments. Capacity of users to access, reuse, and share OER. So we all know that 
it is not just that easy to sit behind the computer and do it. So you have to train. So in Slovenia, we had three years of training. There was a project which actually lasts for three years with several sets of continuous education for teachers to learn about OER, to learn about how to use ICT in classrooms. And this was something which invested, Slovenia invested quite a lot, that we came to the, to the level that there is the awareness and, and knowledge and capacity how to build it. Development of appropriate policy solutions. You have some policy in some countries, you have nothing in some countries, and you have everything in some countries. It's a complete diverse situation. Usually with the policies is like, um, at least in Slovenia, was like when the government says, this is the rule, then the background people will say, the, the, the teachers will say, no, we will not follow the rule because it's the government rule. So it's about making things together. It's about co-creation. And need for clarity of the term open. So you have plenty of things around, you know, like MOOCs, like, like uh, open courseware, which is not necessarily open. So nobody knows what actually means being open. You just think that if something is there on the internet, accessible, that it's open, it's not true. So those are the obstacles which actually are certainly there and has to be somehow, somehow overcome. So uh, what we what we do now at the sorry at the UNESCO is um, is that. Um, there is a need for a normative instrument. The fact is, and I didn't know that, the fact is that the Paris Declaration that has been accepted in, oh, sorry, in 2002 was not actually a formative document. Uh -huh. Sorry. Was not a formative document because this actually didn't went through the formal procedure. Um, what I will do now is just kill this thing. We just kill it. It's okay. No, no, it's okay. So it's, it's, it's a combination of this and the other thing. So Paris Declaration is not officially UNESCO, UNESCO <laughs> standard. Sorry again. We need to kill everything. It's, 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 this is what I will do now, like this. Transition none, and you're done. So this is number one. Number th Jesus, come on. Number two is that is that OER is right now a kind of a um, player in a new UNESCO agenda, which is called Education 2013. And OER is in central of it. So sustainable development goal number four is based on OER. So UNESCO has to do something because they, they make a mistake already in 2012. They need to do something right now. And the idea is that we would try to get on the next step. The next step, which goes further on from the awareness issue. So let's say that right now, the awareness about OER is quite high. On the level of users, on the level of teachers, on the level of professors, on the level of institutions, on the level of, yes, on the level of, 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 um, of governments. But how and why these materials or these policies has not been used is an issue to be tackled with. And this is why we have proposed to UNESCO, and we agreed already, that there will be a recommendation 
for a formal recommendation for OER. We are already starting a process right now, so Slovenia and UNESCO and some countries to go into a procedure to make a formal recommendation for using OER on the national level. Which is a procedure which I didn't know in the past, so actually this is like several steps, very complicated. Um, it will end up in 2019, but there is a milestone in between, which is a conference, which is a OER uh, second level, uh, fourth level conference that will be organizing in Slovenia next, next year. And the idea of this OER conference is to sign the declaration about UNESCO OER. And this was actually go into the, into the direction, into the stream of how to mainstream the OER use. Not how to create the awareness, which was in 2012, but how to actually make the next step, which is pushing things forward into OER use. So, since this is the first milestone and there are other milestones, what we are proposing right now as a country to other countries, like Germany, for example, to create a kind of a pool of leading examples um, in the world, so the countries that are actually pushing things forward on, because UNESCO cannot do it by themselves, and create a kind of a coalition that will actually go from that moment to the end, so and maybe, maybe further on also uh, push it towards to the convention, which is a, then a formal document that everybody can need to sign. So this is what is going on on the UNESCO side. There are things that are going on the European Commission side. So one is still opening up education, which has been published in 2013, is still a communication. But there are things there that, that are coming somehow out of it. So first, you see that some of the proposals which has been published and been published are now already including something which would require a synchronization with the open educational, op uh, opening up education. And opening up education is based on OER. So there is a communication, there is a document to which some units inside the commission actually used to link to them. On the other side, there is the DG EIC, so DG EAC, DG Education. DG Education is now seriously thinking about that mobility of researchers is not really a mobility as it has been thought in the past, which would be me going into a place B. Because there is something else coming into the play, and this is IT. And IT and open education actually are now disruptive elements in something which is, has been as a model uh, in the past in the Commission. There is a mainstreaming right now because they changed also the, the, the directors. So there, they, there is a mainstream right now on open science, which includes open educational resources. And there are several issues about SWOFs, which is a um, science with and for the society, which is a special, a special horizontal cross-cutting group that actually thinks about this mechanism for openness in science and education. So there are things that are going on seriously also inside the Commission. And guess what? The Commission is also taking a part in the UNESCO, UNESCO endeavor. So how we did that in Slovenia? This is what I said. So what we do in Slovenia, what I do, is, is AI, is developing tools. And those tools are very interesting because they can do big data analytics up to reasoning. And these tools are actually bringing on a lot of supplementary things that are actually solving issues that has been uh, defined before as a problems, like content understanding, user understanding, user modeling, personalized education, automatic translation, and all this stuff. So this is actually how we came into the play of open educational resources, and we learned our path through time. So it was a hard issue. So we started to build up our own OER resource in 2002, and we learned all the mistakes, we learned all the problems, all the barriers in real life and we survived and we came up to the end. And this is how we actually came into the play of being the, the first country to set up the national initiative. 
So the main drivers that we start was that we said, if you really want to change something, then you have to do it both ways. So bottom up and top down. So you have to, you have to, you have to build on the basic interest, and the basic interest is there at schools, the basic interest is there at publishers, the basic interest is there at the industry, the basic interest is there at the professors, the kids. So what is the basic interest in open education? So what we actually did, we went to talk with all these people and everybody said to us, well, we have to change something, we have to do something else because as it is right now, the educational system really doesn't work anymore. So we have to do something else. So why don't we try it? Why don't we do it together? And this is what we did. So we started to involve all the stakeholders in Slovenia since we are not that big country like Germany. It, for us, it's easy to sit down and talk to each other. Although, of course, that means that we are also competitors, you know, in the small market. So, a lot of competitors in the small market is usually a, a problem. But there is a common interest. And this common interest actually pushed things forward on. So right now, right now we are having an initiative where we do things which are not really, which are not really, really um, human in the sense of our, th our way of thinking. We don't listen and we don't talk. And the major problem in Slovenia was that we didn't know about what is going on inside the country. So I'm always amazed when I talk to the people, to different stakeholders about what is going on and there are plenty of interesting things. It's just about listen, it's just about to discuss, to be open-minded and say to, the other, to, to each other, so why don't we just, you know, build on top of these best practices and share them. So what we did is this unconditional knowledge sharing, unconditional idea sharing, unconditional everything unconditional. And we are having meetings like 30 people sitting behind the same table, which is always very creative. We don't discuss about the issues, which is who is governments, documents and all this stuff. No, we are talking about real projects, real ideas. And this is what we like. So liking means that you create things, you test things in practice, and you say this works and this doesn't work. And you can only do that if you have something which is a test bed. And Slovenia right now is a test bed as a country. The last partner we invited into the project was actually ministry. We came to the ministry and we said to the ministry, there is a role for you in this endeavor, and the role would be that when there is a need to change the legislation and the policy, you should do it. And the minister said, thank you very much to come to talk to us, because we usually have this problem of us imposing the rules which are not being accepted. And we have this formal policy support. So what we did, what we achieved so far is that we have this first national, first national wide initiative, so everybody knows about Slovenia, you know where we are right now. Um, we have this strategic commitment of Slovenian government. We have the uh, 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 European Commission and UNESCO support, so we have our own desk officer taking care about our project, uh, uh, our initiative at the European Commission. We have first uh, expression of interest for potential investors, which, you know, when you say to somebody who is a big player that you have a country which is a testbed in which you can test big things, disruptive elements, they will be very happy because such country doesn't really exist. We have right now 32 running projects, which are different, different types of, different sorts of, from, from strategic, from infrastructural to to policy level, so everything, you, I will show you some of the stuff. Uh, first, policy initiatives, and we have followers knocking on the door. So, uh, so um, this year, they will be opening up Poland, announced in the, in the conference, the Open Education Conference. There is Scotland, there is Ireland, there are states inside US, so small entities. You have Hamburg here in Germany. It's very, very proactive. The mayor said, I want to be open. I want to have open education. I want to have open education resources and I want to have open universities. So it's not about really about state level. It's about having, a finding a basic interest and then going further on. So here are some of the selective activities. So um, it's everything about very innovative stuff to something which is very infrastructural, but I will show you this. So this, those are the policy adaptation entry points. 
So this is something we, this is just part of the list that we identified as a problem that actually is being right now solved by the ministry. Core group, so this is the core group, so this, is, this was the ones which we, we, we started with. And then the other came in, so, and you can see there is a representative of hospitals of Slovenia because hospitals came out saying that, look, for us, education and training for our staff is very expensive. Why don't we just create and share everything what we have? Very interesting. There are big industries behind, below, saying that we need to do that because for us, this is expensive and we are saving money. So there is a case with Post of Slovenia. They created their own internal educational uh, program for, um, for post office. And since it was so generic in a way that other, other, uh, other companies needed that, and since the post office already, already uh, saved that much money, they said, okay, everything I will give for free because I did my job already. So why should I just take it for myself? So they are very interesting examples. So I'm concluding here. Um, this is just a list of um, uh, acting uh, UNESCO OER chairs. So those are the OER chairs and the two ladies below are right now applying for OER chairs. So this is, UNESCO are telling us that this is the most coherent community of OER chairs, so we have our own projects, joint initiatives. Those chairs will be actually the core brain of the, the development in the UNESCO, in the UNESCO um, uh, uh, normative instrument right now. So uh, you can freely talk to those guys, they are very open, because they do open education resources, so they are very <laughs> open also in the communication. And they have a very, very strong links and they can bring value. Certainly they can bring value because all these people actually tested and developed their own ability and competence in OER through life. So come to Slovenia and learn um, on our success and mistakes. This is, this is the, the final issue. Thank you. So thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I think we learned uh, a lot what uh, has uh, go going on within UNESCO and what has going on in Slovenia. And we know uh, within UNESCO there's a process uh, coming from the uh, recommendations of uh, 2012 to perhaps a normative uh, uh, recommendation uh, in the next years. And uh, uh, we as a German Commission for UNESCO very uh, strongly support Slovenia, who is asking for uh, uh, holding this uh, next uh, worldwide conference. So, but UNESCO is one uh, side of the international discussion. I think uh, even before or uh, at the same time, parallel, OECD was very active uh, on OER. And uh, Dominic, I ask you to uh, make some comments on the role of uh, OECD and uh, uh, of OER in the economic and uh, society process. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. So, uh, good afternoon again. Um, so, uh, I think actually, I mean, the OECD started looking at um, the topic of OER really uh, the mid 2000s and had the first publication in 2007. So I suppose in that way that was they were starting to deal with the OER movement when they were really still a bunch of hippies. And uh, that was really quite interesting for me coming from outside of this whole community um, and being given the task um, to look at the, the uh, look at the topic of OER that uh, this time when I came to this kind of, what they, they call them, so internationally it's, you talk about the OER community, and then I was coming and really, uh, the OECD is not interested in supporting a bunch of hippies. I mean, the OE, OECD is interested in making education better. And I think what has also um, strengthened the interest of the OECD in these kinds of approaches is, in 2008, after we had the financial crisis, there was a, a, a huge debate within the OECD about what kind of um, growth have we been supporting 
in the member countries? What kind of economic models? And there was a huge debate then, um, uh, pretty much under the topic of new growth models. And one of the things there was going back actually to um, some theories on, it, on economics that have been going around for quite a while, which is just saying uh, learning and education is central to a good economy, to a sustainable economy, to a fair economy. And this uh, was taken up as a very important topic for the OECD. And everything that the OECD is currently doing is focused very much on this. So because of that, then the OECD is looking in its education department of how to create reform to make education better. And the idea was, uh, let's relook at OER as one potential innovation um, that could actually um, somehow be making education better, but also maybe, and, and this is why the title of the report is as such, actually promoting other innovative practices around teaching and learning. And so this is the, the, the reason why the OECD is looking at this. So you'll see the, there's a big conference this week from the OECD here in Berlin, uh, which is to do with uh, improving teachers and looking at teacher engagement and saying teachers are such a key element of an education system. Let's look at what makes a good teacher. And a lot of this you can relate back then to OER. So one of the results that's been coming out of various research of uh, the OECD is good teachers are those which co collaborate, particularly with people from other institutions or other schools. And this is something that, uh, of course, one can do very well with through the medium of OER. So I think that's the reason why um, the OECD has been focused in this area. And uh, this is why the report has come out in, in the way it has. And really, this does mean that the OECD will be looking at OER continually, but it's just one of the, f the elements. Mm -hmm. So whether it, whether it stays as president present as it is at the moment, I wouldn't be quite so sure. Um, they, they are looking at ver various other um, elements of innovation and improvement. And, uh, but I think particularly this idea, if UNESCO is going to push it again, um, I think the OECD would play a big role in this because in fact at the start of our project, um, looking at uh, the OER, we actually had very strong contact with uh, UNESCO. The problem is, though, that uh, they really do have staffing problems and time problems, and we simply didn't find anyone who could spend time to actually support us. But I mean, uh, so so there is a lot of cooperation as well between the OECD and UNESCO. And the other thing is, I suppose, the, UNES the OECD has been criticised in the past as being kind of a rich country club. And um, this is also, there's, there's also strategies working against this. So one of my colleagues in the OECD is doing work on uh, what's called frugal innovation in India. So it's, it's really to look, try and look beyond, um, beyond the, the, the member countries uh, of the OECD. And in fact, in our report, uh, we do have some examples of, of interesting OER cases coming from outside um, of the OEC and the member states, because we think, okay, well, if you could, if you found something good, it can be good for other countries as well. Thank you very much. I think uh, uh, we are all aware that that OECD and UNESCO on the other side, they are specialized organizations where the, who concentrate on a certain topic. But uh, uh, regarding the uh, 2013 Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, uh, which uh, were decided by the uh, plenary of the United Nations last year. I think uh, uh, at the end, all international or all global institutions have to look uh, how they can contribute uh, to fulfill these uh, 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 goals uh, uh, which were uh, decided. So I think at the end, we uh, don't have to look only at uh, the scenery in the industrialized countries, uh, as you mentioned already, uh, but we and we haven't only to look at uh, Europe, but we also have to look at the whole world. So I would like uh, that you too add some uh, um, aspects uh, concerning the third uh, world, because, uh, for example, I know that concerning OER, 
uh, Nigeria is taking uh, a very good, it is making very good work, and perhaps uh, uh, you may add to your comments uh, uh, some aspects uh, concerning these in this uh, global situation. Uh, so certainly UNESCO is very active in, in the third countries, so more than every, everybody, uh, so any, anywhere else. In, in fact, the, the first idea of this conference was actually to be in Nairobi, but then, I don't know, something happened, and so we came in and then that was it. But eventually, um, uh, so there is a lot of work being uh, down, uh, work, uh, so pushed down there. So and uh, the problem which I think we have, um, we from the rich countries, or let's say the West, or yeah, North, is one-way communication. Um, when you talk to the people in Africa or in Asia, they will tell you, well. You know, it's not you giving me whatever you have. It's about you listening to me what I have also. It's two-way communication. This is what we don't really think that we are doing. So we, 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 we have our own mental model. We have our own business models. We say, okay, so this, is, this works with us. So probably it will work with you also. And we, you know, create all this bunch of materials, famous professors, teachers, we go down there and say, look guys, this is here, it's very good, it's very, you know, it's excellent. And they're not grasping that because it's a completely different environment, it's a completely different mental model, it's a completely different culture. And we usually, we West people, we are usually not able to listen to them. And these people are always telling me like, uh, I want, for example, in Africa, I want your famous professor to see my Africa. I want these famous guys from MIT to see what we are doing here, and they can show a lot of things. I've seen, I've seen uh, there was this big project. They started in whatever, um, so it was Mazdar City. The first CO2 free whatever city, the big investment. But then the guy came in and said, in the desert, our own old infrastructure is actually already providing everything which is cooling. It's natural cooling without any devices. So why don't we, why we need this stuff? Why don't you just adapt what we have already here? It might work also in your place. So we don't exchange, we don't communicate, and that's a problem. UNESCO tries to do that something on that respect, but certainly the players behind are still the old mental models, which is us, you know, thinking about pushing things down and everybody will be happy. It doesn't really work like this. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, again, the question to you, what the special potential of OER for developing countries? Yeah. Okay, so I, um, I'm actually quite familiar with the sus sustainable development goals because last summer I also was, worked for UNESCO for a, a short period. And um, the interesting thing is, uh, you may have seen, I think it was uh, last week, that the um, the, the, the group who were doing the uh, Global Education Men Monitoring Report brought out a statistic showing uh, across particularly, I think it was in that case they were looking at Africa and they were saying um, ha they had a statistic of how many uh, pupils were sharing a textbook and it was, I think it was in, in, the, in the most positive case it was something like 10 pupils sharing one textbook and then on top of that the problem was often the textbook was not in the native language of the, the, the pupils. So w on this very kind of uh, uh, existential level, of course, OER can really be doing a, a lot to try and help that. And I've been rather surprised because you may have noticed as well, um, just I think two months ago, the World Bank um, just released a new portal, which I think is called something like Anyway, it's got, definitely got the name Open in it. I think it was called Open Learning Portal or something. There's nothing at all which is not protected by the World Bank copyright, strangely. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, so it, we have a bit of a feeling that, you know, it's everyone's going, going in the same way, but they're just not. And in fact, uh, also in the, uh, the paper talking about this problem, 
about the textbooks, there, there was one, uh, one sentence which mentioned open educational resources. So we can, on this kind of very simple level, there's still a lot to be done. But I, I totally agree with you on the other way as well, which is that uh, it's m the OER enables much more of an exchange between, um, b between solutions. You know, it's like this idea, actually, many, many uh, education systems across the world are being confronted with the very same challenges. Their context is different, but the challenge is very similar. And so I very much believe in the idea of looking at the different ways solutions are being found and trying f through comparison to find how we can find uh, good solutions to that. And of course the adaptability uh, works very well. So some of my colleagues from, um, uh, from uh, Norway who work on the uh, Norwegian learning digital area, they work, uh, I think they were working recently in Ethiopia with a group where they were taking a lot of the resources they've already got in Norway and then trying to readapt those so that they would work as well in Ethiopia. So there is this huge potential. Um, and I, uh, the, the two things I would agree on the one side, the one thing that often happens which is bad is, okay, we, j we got something that works here, let's just get you guys to use it. But the other thing is often that um, um, there's, not really a, there's not really this recognition that uh, many of these problems are happening across the world about the same time. So you really can learn through comparison. And, and that is the reason why organizations, the international organizations such as UNESCO, the OECD, actually the World Bank as well, really are central because they're the central hubs where people are coming together to talk about this. And this is often why the OECD picks up certain topics. It's because policy makers and ministers are coming to them and saying, we've heard about this, what should we be doing? So, so you're, you're hearing from there, and it's got to come to a hub. And the European Commission can work in a similar way as well. Thank you very, very much for your comments and uh, uh, global aspects. Uh, I'm very convinced uh, that uh, we are not able uh, to, uh, 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 to answer to the big challenges of illiteracy and uh, uh, closed access at the moment for uh, younger, younger people uh, if we don't uh, uh, look for OER as, a, uh, as an instrument and as possibilities uh, uh, to open the access for all, access for all uh, and to give uh, uh, the chance for adults uh, again to, or to, uh, to start to learn uh, something. So I think uh, there is a, uh, what, what concerns uh, OER this is not at, at all only a technical instrument, but this is a uh, pedagogic instrument. Uh, it, it is an instrument for, uh, uh, to, to guarantee a better education, more quality of education, and more individualism uh, within education. So at the end, more participation, and that means uh, that we uh, may have a chance uh, to hear what people like to uh, be realized uh, in the world. So thank you uh, too very much. I think uh, we are, uh, sorry, at the end of this uh, last panel. Uh, and uh, uh, I thank the auditory uh, for being here uh, and listening to us. Thank you very much.